All right, everybody, I think we're ready to go. Um, I'll just leave my video feed here, um, but Anton's got the, uh, got the mic going on here, so. Wow, that took a while. Um, so yeah, this is lecture five, and the topic is basically gonna be plastics, both as a problem and kind of as a, as a technology. Um, so I'm curious for you guys here, how many of you have taken uh, like a polymer class or anything like that? Chemistry, kind of, okay. Then, yeah, we'll see how this goes. Um, it should be fun, I hope. Um, so the first part is the kind of the problem statement. So plastics by the numbers, uh, since about the 1950s, once plastics became industrialized, we made a lot of plastics. Um, and, you know, a natural question you might have is where are they now? And, you know, these guys did a did sort of a numbers crunching kind of a Fermi problem style paper trying to answer that question. So since 2015, about six billion, 6,300 million tons of plastic have been produced. And of that, 9% has been recycled, 12% has been incinerated, and 80% has basically been accumulated in landfill or the natural environment. And this trend is not looking great, uh, it's increasing, incineration is on the rise. And by 2050, that number is likely to double. Um, and just for comparison, that's about 6,000 million tons of plastic is about the equivalent of 20,000 Empire State Buildings if you were to add up all that mass. Um, so it's a big problem. Uh, it's also a global problem. Um, this is a map showing, uh, at least before 2018, all the plastic that China was importing from the rest of the world. So mostly Europe, mostly the US. Uh, post 2018, they modified, they had some uh, legal changes that forced them to uh, reduce the amount of waste that they're importing. And so now a lot of that waste is being taken out from other countries like uh, Indonesia, Thailand, India and several countries in Africa are also uh, sort of making up that difference. And now they're importing that waste out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Is this something that they're paying for or that they're, you know, they're getting paid for? Like, how does that? How does yeah, that um, I believe they do get paid for it. So there's a, the, the supply chains between um, people that collect waste and people that try to do something productive with it can be quite complex and opaque. Um, but as a, as a fraction of sort of industry, like we don't have a lot of uh, domestic recycling capabilities in the US, most of that is overseas. Um, so as long as there's a market for recycled products, then there'll be a market for moving uh, that, that sort of raw feedstock to other countries. Um, and some of it is just, we're paying it to go to other countries landfill. Um, and then of course, with all this movement uh, of materials around, there's leakage uh, and there's mismanagement. So, you know, uh, Manu mentioned the context of the ocean last week in, in a lot of detail. Um, so since, you know, in the last decade, five to 13 million tons, it's a tough number to estimate of that, you know, uh, plastic that's generated has ended up in the oceans according to this other sort of uh, by the numbers paper. Um, and then a little bit more detail, you know, it's, uh, how much of that is litter just from, you know, people going about their daily business? How much of it is falling off dump trucks? How much of it is because of uh, just illicit dumping activities? Um, you know, it ends up being hundreds, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of tons uh, in each of those different sectors. So um, that's sort of an aspect of this activity that we, you know, we as individuals kind of see on a day-to-day -day basis, but remains kind of opaque from a global statistics point of view until people like this kind of do the hard work of doing those estimates. Um, and then the other perspective that I kind of like, apart from just the lens of uh, thinking about it as an environmental disaster, it's also kind of a financial disaster, right? Every bottle, every uh, disposable package you see there, that's money spent by a company that's literally just thrown away. So, uh, you know, and of course it's also a non-renewable resource. So here, this is from, um, uh, the chemical company BASF, um, together with Deloitte, um, the accounting firm, basically calculated this number for Canada, and Canada alone produces like 
12 billion dollars of single-use disposable packaging that's just dumped um, each year uh, at least that'll be the projection by 2030 um, so but you know of course it's not all bad uh, you look at this picture and I don't know how how well your eyes are trained to plastic but it's everywhere, you know. This gown here, that's spun bound polypropylene. The mask is uh, milk blown polypropylene. All of these structural components are like the PVC. This uh, covering here to cover the chair is I'm not really sure what plastic that would be, maybe a cellulose acetate, uh, if I had to guess. But there's an enormous amount of plastic here that is structural, that, you know, some of it will stay around for decades. The gloves, probably a few minutes. Um, and all of this stuff is pretty important for maintaining the quality of life. So it's, a, it's, it's again, a really complex uh, problem with sort of a lot of love-hate uh, built into it. Um, and this sort of quantifies that observation where you, if you notice things like the, the sort of x-ray uh, equipment and yeah, some of the more uh, structural components, right? These will have very long lives uh, in the real world. So here, uh, you know, building and construction, uh, plastics related to building and construction will persist for 40 years or more. Um, so a lot of things that were, you know, say made in the 80s are still around and haven't entered landfill or waste streams. Uh, on the other hand, things like packaging ha might have a lifetime of minutes. You buy a bag of potato chips and then they're, they're gone. Uh, and then there's everything in between. And this sort of co covers the, the breadth of sectors in which plastic is used in significant amounts. Everything from textiles, um, to yeah, industry, transportation. I mean, you walk into a subway, right? All the interior parts are probably made out of some form of polypropylene, maybe uh, PVC for the wiring. Uh, so in thinking about where you might want to intervene and in thinking about plastic, plastic alternatives, this, I think these time scales might be useful. Um, and it's also not just in the end of life, uh, creating plastics is also um, resource intensive and that is changing uh, as manufacturing moves uh, across the world. So this is a relatively recent paper that came out, I think in the last few months of 2021, but basically it's breaking down the fossil resource footprint of global plastics. And you can see most of it's coal, uh, about a quarter of it is petroleum. Um, and the reason for this sort of, the use of coal is actually increasing. The reason for that is because the region where plastics are being produced is being shifted from uh, regions where there's tighter environmental regulations that have come online in the last several, in the last decade or so, to regions where there are more lax uh, regulations. So China and Indonesia are large producers. Um, uh, and then this next section is showing where, uh, yeah, where they're, yeah, basically where resources are extracted and then where those uh, uh, are used for plastics, specifically production. And then finally, the region where plastics are consumed. So basically, you go from regions where they're produced, uh, developed world is relatively small, but um, account for a large source of consumption. So basically, the statement there is that we're offsetting uh, in sort of high GDP countries, um, the carbon footprint of plastic consumption to countries with uh, coal-based infrastructure. Uh, and that's a trend that's continuous. Right. So yeah. When we're talking coal here, um, what is the coal being used for? Yeah, that's a great question. That's largely uh, energy, right? To run injection mold. Uh, a lot of a lot of plastics are manipulated thermally, so you need a lot of energy for that. Um, let's see. Yeah, and some more trends. Um, this is one that I thought was really interesting. That that incineration is a is a growing fraction of waste disposal, um, and then also the region with the most um, uh, highest growth of plastic production and likely also consumption is the Middle East and Africa, um, growing very quickly. Um, so just a couple, just a couple more trends to keep in mind that may or may not keep you up at night. Um, so the question is kind of how did we get here? And this is where uh, the rest of most of the rest of the this this lecture will be on just building a sense of what plastics are, vocabulary, kind of concepts, physical chemical concepts, and a little bit of history for fun. Um, so the modern plastic industry basically grew out of um, kind of this desire to replicate what this worm makes, 
that's a silkworm, it makes silk, uh, which is a fantastic material for, for a lot of different applications. And, uh, you know, one of the earliest successes were in uh, sort of spinning polymers. So this is a, a benchtop demonstration of the production of nylon. Um, uh, and this, uh, yeah, so both of these, both of these are basically driven out of a need to replace um, scarce uh, natural resources. So silk is hard to make because, you know, it's intensive to grow silkworms. These bowling balls are actually really interesting. Sorry, billiard balls are really interesting. Originally, they were made out of ivory, uh, which again is a hard material to get. Um, and one of the first industrial uh, plastics processing methods was producing this, uh, this sort of uh, artificial ivory, which was basically made out of nitrocellulose with, mixed with a little molecule called camphor. And this camphor is basically a plasticizer. Um, which prevents these from crumbling instantly. Um, and then I guess another little bit of curiosity is uh, uh, the base polymer is nitrocellulose, which is quite flammable. So people would be, you know, playing billiards, and then cigarette might get in contact with these billiard balls, and they basically catch on fire pretty aggressively. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we've come a long way. Um, yeah, uh, but I guess before we go get into a little bit of the details, um, I want to backtrack to I think last Friday, where we were talking, we were looking at milk and looking at the little colloids uh, or little you know little bubbles in um, uh, droplets in milk, and Manu had asked the question of uh, why do they jiggle? Did anyone do a deep dive on that and figure out why? I wasn't able to do it earlier today, but I don't want to spoil it again. Okay. <laughs> Well, someone's got enough guess. You need one guess before we'll spoil it. That's fair. No guesses? I'll give you a hint. It has to do with, uh, oh, that was a good hint. Thermodynamics? Yeah. Oh, why do things jiggle at small length scales? Why do they move around? Uh, sorry, you said something about energy? What was it? Well, like they're trying to reach the lowest energy state. Oh, interesting. I wouldn't say that's quite the answer. It does have to do, I guess, with transfer of energy. Mm -hmm. so. Is it temperature? Ah, temperature. More about what is temperature? It's uh, energy. Ah, interesting. What yeah. type of energy specifically? You've got a couple, you know, a couple of types, you know, when, when you talk about uh, in physics when you first learn energy. Yeah, potential energy. You've got What's kinetic, kinetic energy? energy. Interesting. Yeah. Kinetic energy of what? So temperature is kinetic energy. Yeah. Um, kinetic energy, or just related to kinetic energy. The, the kinetic energy of what specifically? Ah, yes. Molecules out of yes. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Background thermal energy. Yes. Yeah. So why would kinetic energy make things jiggle? Ah, and what does transfer of kinetic energy look like? Movement. Boom. Yeah. Movement. Things hitting each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. There you go. I think you guys have the answer now. So why do things jiggle at small length scale? Because it's like changing like over time with like motion. It is exactly grounding motion. <laughs> That's right. Nice. You got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now the next step is going from the observation of Brownian motion to proving that atoms exist. Any guesses there? You don't have to answer that, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's that's kind of where this goes, because uh, you can do that calculation, uh, and I'll show you the guy that did it. Um, but you know, in, in in preparing a little bit for uh, for this lecture, I was looking into the history of just polymers, and it's it's um, it's kind of interesting. So Richard Feynman basically said, you know, if civilization were to be wiped out. Um, what single scientific idea would be the most important one to preserve? And he argued that it was uh, basically the existence of the atom. Um, and whether or not that's true, I guess you can kind of think on that at your leisure. But um, 
it's an interesting step to go from the existence of the atom to the zoo of molecules, if you will. Um, and, you know, Einstein, uh, <laughs> Einstein basically showed uh, that uh, atoms exist through a, through a calculation that he did in 1905. And then by 1920 or so, he had this chemist, Hermann Staudinger, who was arguing that there would be giant molecules that should exist because of goo that he saw in the laboratory. And so he wrote, um, you know, he was trying to basically defend this idea. And uh, one of his colleagues really discouraged him, you know, abandon your idea of large molecules, organic molecules with molecular weights exceeding 5,000 don't exist. Um, you know, if you do the experiment, you'll see that they're small molecules. And, um, you know, he wasn't discouraged, and uh, but he he uh, he kept on it and uh, said, you know, those colleagues who are aware of my early publications um, asked me why I decided to quit these beautiful fields of research and, and devoted myself to such disgusting and ill-defined compounds such as rubber and synthetic polymers, which at that time of uh, which at that time, in view of their properties, referred to as grease chemistry. So, you know, I, you kind of have to admire somebody that that. Uh, really went all out there to study something as uh, kind of strange as these greasy things uh, and also convince people that his idea was right. Um, so, and he did, right? So, and I, I just kind of was amazed at this timeline between, you know, 20 years when, uh, between Einstein's demonstration that atoms were probably real to now you have this, these massive compounds. It was, it was a lot to take in in two decades, I think, from a, just your view of the world. So, um, so what are plastics? Plastics are polymers or macromolecules. They're big, giant molecules. And really to kind of understand them, um, it comes down to these two points, chemical structure and understanding the fact that there, there isn't a singular weight for them. There isn't a singular size for them. Um, they have a molecular weight distribution. Uh, and you can kind of reason through how polymers should behave if you get these two I ideas down a little bit. So that's the next several slides are going to be kind of just exercises and, uh, you know, some vocabulary and some ideas. So um, chemical structure, this is a, a nice guide to common household plastics. Uh, I'm sure these, are, these mostly correspond, I think, to the recycling categories. Um, and I also have examples out here. So Tyler, maybe if you just pass around these things to, yeah. to just touch and play with and appreciate how similar yet how different they are. Um, plastic. <laughs> we get plastic. We get plastic. Very happy. <laughs> so yeah. So these are the monomers. Um, and I guess the thing to notice in all of these is that the the the, the backbone is roughly the same. In most of these, you have carbon, carbon bonds in the backbone. Um, and then the side chains are basically different. So in some cases you have hydrogen, those are uh, polyolefins. This one you have a larger, uh, sort of a larger uh, methyl group there. So that give, provides you more space uh, on the backbone. Here you have fluorines. Um, which basically will change how it might interact with its environment. Um, this polystyrene has a, has a large backbone. So basically all these subtle differences contribute to the, dip, the, the material differences, partly, of all the materials that you have around. Um, Out of curiosity, does anyone have an intuition as to why if all these all these polymers have basically the same or very similar backbone? Um, does anyone have an intuition as to why just changing the little stuff that's sticking off the backbone would have such a big effect on their properties? Like any guesses? There's like many, many correct answers. I'm just curious. That's partly yeah. true. Mm -hmm. Um, and the environment, yeah, that's that's definitely an interesting point. So they're they're interacting differently um, with yeah with the environment. Um, density is an interesting question. So that's 
Yeah, mm -hmm. self interaction. I think is also correct. all of those are right. All these are correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's cool because they they end up like you can model them in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But um, and uh, yeah, some of them, some of these might be like very obvious. You studied this already, but like there's a lot of really interesting properties that emerge just from side chains. Um, in that you can imagine that if you have uh, a particularly you know large or fuller or non fuller side chain, it really you know. Mm -hmm. It really changes everything about what's going on, and actually, this is what proteins are, right? Like proteins are also, um, you know, polymers, uh, just polymers of a different type. Exactly. And proteins are all about their size. Yeah, and then from the chat, there's a sterics, so basically, yeah, size, um, charges, uh, and electronegativity. So, yeah, I guess uh, one intuitive way is. Uh, yeah, how polarized are they? How what's their charge distribution? Are they neutral? Are they charged? All of that will affect uh, their behavior. So um, let's see. So yeah, so from those monomers, you build up polymers, usually through a polymerization reaction, which is pretty intuitive, I think. Um, so one of my favorite industrial polymers is uh, polypropylene, which I think is in there. In Two, we're all breathing through it right now uh, through actually two different types. We've got a, what's known as a spun bound polypropylene layer and then a melt blown polypropylene layer uh, sandwiched between that. Uh, and that's extruded into fibers. There's a falcon tube around there, which is a solid uh, manifestation of polypropylene. Um, and a lot of the, so there's two things in there. One is they're processed in different ways, uh, but they're also um sort of polymerized in different ways to allow for that different processing um right so that polymerization is a statistical process uh which means that you do your reaction and you don't know how long each length has grown uh it's it's going to be a distribution and so there's a lot of tricks that might be played with narrowing that broadening it um maybe even making it bimodal. Um, and you can put a number to that, but it's got air bars. So you have these sort of two different uh, ways of quantifying that that are uh, commonly used, which is basically your mole fraction of chains. Uh, so basically how many monomers are in a chain and then what is the average weight of that chain are basically the two different ways of looking at this. Um, yeah, and uh, a lot of Intuition can come from basically keeping in mind that it's a breadth of objects, not, not a singular one. Um, and this has a lot of uh, implications for pretty much all the properties. So um, basically, as you increase the size of your chain, uh, all of these properties sort of scale with that. So um, it increases the melt temperature and the glass transition temperature. Those are ideas that I'll get it to in another uh, in a few slides. Um, it, improve, it, it will increase the sort of mechanical property. So the difference between high density and low density polyethylene, for instance, so the difference between a Ziploc bag and, you know, your, uh, the bottle your like detergent comes in is basically it's using much, much longer chains. Um, and then finally, rheology. So longer chains will create a much more viscous or honey-like solution. Um, or if you're dealing with just pure polymer and there's no solution involved, uh, it'll also be much more viscous. Uh, okay. So then there's also this idea, I've, I've been basically saying, you know, there's a chain there, but like, what does it actually look like? Is it sort of ordered like that where it's sort of pressed into each other? Is it disordered like a piece of loose yarn? Is it elongated? Um, or is it, uh, you know, something else like maybe this coiled configuration? Um, and thinking through or like being able to say, definitively which case it'll be is actually really challenging. That's, that's the realm of sort of computational um, polymer chemistry, basically. Um, but, uh, but it's just worth keeping in mind that all of these possibilities can exist. And, and, and also, uh, what is the driving force for that? The driving force is the same driving force that keeps the, the oil droplets bouncing around. Thermal motion will basically uh, uh, you know, knock these conformations into, into different places. They're likely all possible in some extent. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and of course, 
thermodynamics always applies so things do want to minimize their energy but finding what that minimum is can be challenging um, and to give you a sense of where it gets challenging um, you know with the carbon carbon backbone all those little monomers can sort of rotate around and if you just have two of them right you basically have two different backbones i wish i had a, a model here but basically when the uh there's a lowest energy one, and then there's two higher ones that are both possible. Uh, and the thing with polymers, of course, is that it's not just two, it's thousands. So all of these are turning simultaneously. They're being, uh, you know, um, bombarded by, by the surrounding solvent molecules. And out of that pops sort of these com confirmations. Uh, so it's a very dynamic picture. Um, you don't generally understand how this rotation causes different energies of the two there. So I guess if anyone is slightly confused, like uh, the basically if you look at the molecule here, you have some hydrogen sticking off, and you also have uh, the CH three, which is going to be much larger than a single hydrogen. So the steric they call it steric interaction. It's basically just you know stuff getting in the way of other stuff. Uh, <laughs> and if you have these two that are very close to each other, they're going to be a high, in a higher energy conformation than if they're fully opposed to one another. If that makes sense. So there's a ton about energetics in this whole chain packing behavior, some of which is within a single molecule and a lot of it, or within a single neighboring monomers in a single polymer. And then a lot of it ends up being, uh, you know, as they start folding it back on, on top of themselves, um, they have a lot of very interesting properties like crystallinity, like polymers are actually, um, can, can be crystalline, uh, which is somewhat surprising. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of interesting things there. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's, it's, it's, I think part of the beauty is how many different uh, things can emerge from, from just twisting chains. Um, yeah, and then I guess one, you know, there's also different ways of thinking about, well, how long is a polymer actually? Um, and I, I think you can kind of do a calculation where if you were to imagine it, just stretching it out end to end um, versus putting it into a ball, the difference can be astonishing. Um, depending on the numbers, of course, you know, you can have a, a polymer coiled up uh, to be the size of maybe five nanometers, but then if you were to extend it out, it would be two microns. And the same thing happens with DNA, right? And there's all this machinery and how, do, how does the cell know how to unpack this DNA um, from such a dense state? Um, and so there's a whole protein machinery around that if, if biology is sort of a familiar context. Um, but yeah, but so again, these things are always in motion. Um, and uh, so going back a little bit to, uh, to, to how do we, uh, how did this, um, yeah, how did we learn this, right? So basically uh, looking at little droplets of oil, there was a physicist that, uh, a biologist, biologist, John Perrin, who um, basically just look at, at all those jiggling and actually wrote down his observations by hand in uh, uh, the early 19th century. And from that was actually able to make that calculation that, uh, um, that Einstein had predicted, right? So this is sort of, I should have put this earlier in the, in the slide, but um, yeah, this is basically the map from, from this data he was able to extract that, the, that, that, that atoms do exist and was able to make a prediction for the size of the uh, size of a molecule. Um, and the same driving forces are moving polymers. Um, and this is sort of a, another visualization of this idea that the surrounding water molecules can guide much larger particles. So this is sort of how um, something that is invisible, like a molecule of water, can um, move a much larger particle that we see. So this is essentially uh, the physics behind what we saw on Friday. Um, And yeah, so now, you know, instead of a colloid or a little ball, right, we have these chains. Um, and one question is just how to think about how they might get into solution. And this we, we alluded to earlier uh, a few minutes ago uh, in thinking about, um, right, it's these side chains that, that really affect, um, you know, how they interact with their environment. So, you know, here is a polymer, that's, that's a polymer known as polyvinyl alcohol, um, the rule, like dissolves like, always applies. Um, so water and uh, something that has basically 
the same group there, OH, um, that will dissolve really well. Um, here's polystyrene. If you put that into toluene, which is just this, uh, you know, basically looks the same, right? You get good, good uh, solubility. Um, but then there's a couple other things that make polymers a little bit more complicated to think about when it comes to solubility, which is, again, the, the size distribution. The larger your polymer, the more difficult it is to get into solution. Um, and the reason for that is you have to think about entropy. Um, and just as an intuitive way of, of thinking about that is to have this sort of, uh, you know, uh, all those different conformations are being uh, sampled in the solution. Um, and uh, yeah, in order to, to uh, overcome that entropy, you're typically gonna have to um, introduce yeah, more energy, uh, more energy or, uh, uh, you know, let me, let me rephrase this. It's been a while since I've thought about uh, Gibbs law. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so basically polymer confirmations, um, uh, yeah. Um, let's see what, Um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. We can talk about uh, solution theory offline if that's something that is interest, interest, of interest to you. But I think the rules are just like dissolves like, um, your, your, your polymer chain distribution matters. Um, the more like a crystal you are, the more tightly packed, the more difficult it will be for you to be in solution because you're less accessible to um, your solution. Um, and then also cross-linking, which is a process I'll get to in a little bit, uh, will also basically eliminate any chance of you dissolving um, because you're linked. <laughs> um, so this is in the case where I take a polymer and then I put it into solution. There's another situation which is much more common for industrial processing, which is uh, polymer melts. Um, and this is where the solution is basically the polymer itself. Um, so here is just a nice little video of probably the funnest uh, polymer melt, which is, uh, which is silly putty. And it gets, gives you another sense for some of the strange properties of polymers, which are viscoelasticity. So basically over small time scales, the material behaves as a solid. Um, and over longer time scales, is that playing? Let's do it again. So here you should see the ball bouncing. So it behaves like a solid, it has a nice uh, elastic response. And then if you let it sort of hang out over time, um, it'll behave like a liquid. So that's the, the viscous response. Um, and again, that has to do with the time scale in which the, the polymer chains rearrange, uh, can rearrange uh, uh, with themselves. And there is an alternative model uh, for describing this called the reptation model. Um, and this is a fun history. Uh, there's a this Scientific American paper or a Physics Today paper. There's a nice job of just, um, you know, the, the, way, the way it was sort of, uh, the idea originated was basically in the spirit of a Fermi problem, just asking what are, taking some very simple observations like, oh, at one time scale, it behaves like a liquid and at another time scale, it behaves like a solid. Uh, and then making some very simple assumptions about maybe polymer behave, looks like spaghetti, um, is able to come up with these scaling laws that allows you to predict that um, in this sort of polymer melt environment, uh, the relaxation time scales with the cube of the, of the number of, of monomers. Um, and so here, basically, the, the trick was to replace all of the neighboring spaghetti with, with a tube. And if you look at this paper, uh, you can see sort of the logic by which, uh, by which that assumption uh, was justified. Um, and I'll add here that it turns out in experiment, the exponent isn't perfectly a cube. It usually is around 3.4. And to my understanding, that's, that discrepancy hasn't really been well explained. Um, but it comes up in a couple other um, properties that this model might predict. Um, and then here, I wanted to share kind of a cool application of silly putty and graphene, um, where I think this is a kind of a nice application of maybe a frugal uh, 
uh, frugal sensor. So basically by putting um, graphene, oh, I'll, I'll let this video explain. Uh, oh, do we have to worry about sound? So, yeah, so that's basically silly putty with loaded with 10% graphene. So it retains its viscoelastic properties, but now it's electrically conductive. And so by bending uh, this graphenized silly putty, it's able to record changes in its, uh, uh, in its structure. And then here they're using it as basically a continuous, uh, not just pulse meter, but also, uh, I believe this is also showing blood pressure, which is pretty impressive. And all that's going on is uh, the silly putty is poorly cross-linked. And I'll give you an example of what cross-link is a little bit more concretely later. Um, the poor cross-linking provides mobility for these interacting sheets of graphene. And when the graphene basically connect, they, they form a, uh, a conduction path that allows electricity to be uh, conducted. And as your, as your heart is beating, right, it moves ever so slightly and, and this, material is sense enough to, sensitive enough to pick up those changes. Um, so it's a very simple idea of that might actually be fairly useful. Um, hmm? Oh, graphene, you know graphite, what's in lead pencils? It's a single layer of that. So if you were to take uh, you know, your lead pencil and basically with a piece of scotch tape, peel away layer by layer, you'd end up with graphene if you do it until you have one layer. <clears throat> and at this point, I'm going to take a quick break to grab some water. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, if there's any questions or discussion points. Yes, any, any questions? Otherwise, <laughs> yes, that is, that is a good question. So it's not that there's exactly one layer in that whole series, but there's many examples of, there are many like copies, I guess, of the one layer sheet uh, of graphene. Um, but gra graphene is cool. People talk about this as like, this is a very fancy material. Everyone talks about graphene. Um, there's a lot of hype in it uh, that goes in and out, basically because I think the interesting property of it, um, since it is a, a single sheet of carbon atoms, all basically uh, like bonded together in this very interesting cycle. You get really interesting electrical properties, I guess all kinds of properties, but it ends up having like very high tensile strength for weight because it's a single sheet, but these bonds are fairly strong. So you can do interesting things with it. Um, a lot of very cool electrical things too. So this, in this case, um, since graphene is conductive in this particular configuration, um, they're able to basically use this uh, sort of composite of some polymer, which is sort of squishy and non-conductive. And this graphene, which is small but conductive, just forms some sort of uh, strain sensor so that as you as you, you can imagine, if you uh, squish that polymer, more conductive pieces of this graphene will get either <laughs> closer to each other or farther from each other. And then you can use that to detect that conductivity. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. There's, there's a lot of interesting properties that you can play around with. Yeah. Um, in this do a sample polarization where you basically end up processing like the, the sample and you wash away all the things you don't want. What, how is it like that process related? You say the process is processing. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yes. I have a couple slides on that. Oh, okay. perfect. <clears throat> but um, how is it related to the silly putty example? Yeah, I kind of like the overall concept. Mm -hmm. Like, like what is the. the yeah. yeah. So, like, what is a cross link? I guess would be the first question. Any detail that what, what, what would be defined as a cross link? I don't know if it's like a really strictly defined thing, but I guess maybe. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, in polymers, if you have many cross links, uh, you can imagine you've got like a particular, particularly you know, long polymer between side chains coming off. You cross link this in a big, in a big, you know, mix. Um, these now these spaghetti noodles become a network. Of, of spaghetti, um, which has to do with this, and, and we mentioned earlier, cross-linking 
um, is one of those things that will completely kill your solubility. So if you start with spaghetti and then you put it in water, you can imagine the spaghetti noodles will eventually fall, or will eventually dissolve. Um, but if you now cross like all the spaghetti and now it's crazy net, um, it's really not going to be soluble at all. So if this kind of is like an intuition, you might be able to think before the slides, I guess, of how that might be related to a microscopy, to like if you're standing and washing things. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's a whole zoo of like that's a whole sort of sub discipline of chemistry uh, on its own. Um, and I'll give you some of the some historical examples of important cross-linking uh, reactions a little bit later. So, um, so there's this other big idea in polymers, which is a glass transition temperature. So it's called that because it comes from glass. Um, here's two forms of glass. That's uh, this is glass as it's being made. You know, it's typically worked with under heat. And the reason for that is when you heat it up, it's plastic. Uh, and then as it cools, it becomes solid, except it really isn't. It's a glass. Um, so the difference between a glass and a solid is that basically it's still a liquid, except that it's relaxing incredibly slowly. It's almost frozen, but it's still not solid. Uh, the time scale of relaxation ends up being like, hundreds of thousands of years, um, millions of years. It's like, uh, that would be another good Fermi problem or back of the envelope calculation, but it's incredibly long. So eventually this will move, but I don't think the universe will be around. Um, and again, here's sort of a molecular picture of glass versus solid. Glass is ordered, or sorry, solid is ordered, like on the left. And then a glass is disordered. It's basically liquid, but frozen in except it's still kind of moving in a end of the universe kind of a sense. Uh, and this happens for polymers as well. Most polymers look kind of like hard ramen. Uh, so this would be called a semi-crystalline state where you have regions of uh, order that are like a, a solid, and then you have regions of disorder, uh, which are amorphous. And the amorphous regions have a glass transition. So there's, uh, there'll be a range of temperatures over which they can become mobile. Um, and you can see this here, where if you were to uh, look at basically the ability to deform the material as you increase temperature, you go from a very cold state, uh, you'll eventually encounter the glass transition. And that will mark a point where you go from being sort of brittle like glass to a highly elastic state like the molten glass, where now you can work with it. Um, and then there'll be another temperature where it's, 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 uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a totally liquid state. So I think uh, a good concrete example here is actually with the Ziploc bag versus the polystyrene culture dish. Um, <clears throat> so the Ziploc bag is made out of polyethylene. Its glass transition temperature is below room, uh, below room temperature. And so it's in the highly elastic state, and that's why it's flexible. The polystyrene, on the other hand, is not. Uh, its glass transition temperature, I think, is at like 80 degrees Celsius. So, in most, you know, unless you heat it above 80 degrees, it's going to be rigid. It's going to be in that glassy state. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'll probably skip this slide. Um, increasing chain flexibility. So some of the factors that influence this glass transition temperature it comes back down to um, your monomers. So here, several different monomers. And um, basically, these, from these structures, you can kind of get a sense for how they might change this ability of the, of the polymer to move around. So glass transition is all about the polymer to move around. So in this case, with uh, PDMS, polydimethylsilazane. You have a silica and oxygen backbone. The silica is very large. Oxygen is also fairly large. Um, and that provides mobility. Polyethylene, um, everything's pretty tight. You, you have, as we saw earlier, you know, all those carbons have the ability to move around. But the hydrogens, they can move. Here, with polyethylene terephthalate, you have this large benzene ring in there, which restricts movement. This is flat. 
Uh, and then this, this effect is sort of increased even further uh, in polyphenylene oxide. So we have this large building block that just can't move. And so it's going to be quite brittle until it gets a lot of energy that can move this big, chunky building block. Um, so this is all along the chain. Then there's steric effects associated with the side chain. So again, hydrogen is a pretty small side chain. Uh, you can increase it more by adding methyl groups. You get polypropylene. Increase it further by adding this acetate group. Even further with a benzene green. These are huge structures, right? And that's, that's again, the, the Petri dish. And then finally, this is a, another one where they basically just make the benzene ring bigger. And uh, you get another 35 degrees of your, of your TG value. So, so now we have backbone and side chain working together to define this ability of the polymer to move in response to temperature. And that sort of gives you the difference between a hard plastic and, a, and a, you know, the, the Petri dish and the, and the Ziploc bag. Um, and then there's another aspect, inter <clears throat> intermolecular interactions. So here, polyvinyl, polyvinyl chloride, which I think there's a cross floating around back there. Polyvinyl chloride is a very hard material. Um, it's able to form these hydrogen bonds. So all of these chains are very tightly interacting with each other. So hydrogen bond, uh, for those of you that uh, don't know, or um, just a refresher, right? It's this ability for uh, electron density to be shared between elements. It's why water is very cohesive. Um, and it's probably one of the more important non-covalent um, bonds in polymer chemistry. Um, and compared with something like polypropylene, which doesn't have that ability, you notice that there's a hundred degree difference between um, between the last transition temperatures. <clears throat> um, and then finally, back to molecular weight. So the longer your chain is, uh, generally the higher your glass transition temperature will be. Um, and there's a, this Fox-Flurry equation, which basically gives a nice uh, closed form for that as a function of how long your chain is. <clears throat> and another sort of intuition there is basically smaller chains have more free volume. So they're, they have more mobility. Uh, so basically with less energy, you can get them to move around and uh, it'll lower your, your glass transition temperature. Uh, and here's cross-linking. So this is historically the, it's one of the earliest um, sort of applications and landmarks in the history of plastics um, and polymers. Uh, this is the vulcanization reaction developed by Charles Goodyear in the 1840s or so. And he basically was working with rubber, which chemically is polyisoprene. Uh, and basically by heating it up with sulfur, uh, sulfur molecularly is this, eight, uh, this octagonal uh, molecule, which is kind of, kind of a chemical curiosity. But if you eat those together, you'll basically tie these side chains together. And that's, you're cross-linking the, the polymer chains. And this will convert your you know, ooze that comes from a tree to uh, something that's pretty solid, even as it, as it collects energy from being driven. Um, and then this went on to you know, lead to, um, you know, it's used on every card, I think, to this day. But uh, also another little bit of historical context, maybe looking towards next week um, or next lecture with biopolymers. Uh, uh, there's this wonderful little paper that I came across that uh, argues that uh, the ancient civilizations in Mesoamerica were really sophisticated in their use of cross-linking reactions and their ability to manipulate polymers. So here um, in this region in, in southern Mexico and Central America, there's a, a, an abundance of a tree called Castilla elastica that um, when you add the, the juice of the moon, moonflower, I believe, it can create a cross-linking reaction uh, whose mechanical properties can be tuned. And, I, um, and so this is from a, some ethnologists that actually kind of went out and replicated the processes that they read about from 3,000-year-old text from the Olmec and showed that you can sort of tune uh, these mechanical properties. Um, and those are used to produce things like footwear and um, to, to fasten different components together. Um, and then another one from the biology context is, uh, is this uh, uh, polyacrylamide uh, gel, which is usually done for um, 
electrophoresis. So it's a way of separating molecules. So cross-linking can be used not just to tune mechanical properties, but also to control sort of the swelling behavior or the porosity. Um, so basically you add, you know, you double the amount of cross-linker, you shrink the size of the pore, and that'll affect the ability of large molecules to diffuse through it. Um, and, you know, here's an example, relatively fancy example, where they, in the same object, tune the cross-linker so that you can get this sort of progression of molecules that can go through it. But the downside of it is it's fairly toxic, and, uh, you know, an interesting challenge might be to think of, you know, what, what's something that sort of has this level of resolution, but might be more friendly or sustainable to work with. Um, so that could be an interesting uh, project for people to think about as well. Um, and then the final sort of ingredient in the world of plastics that I'll mention is are plasticizers. So uh, I mentioned with those bowling ball, uh, billiard balls, uh, the key there to avoid them from looking like this was the introduction of a plasticizer. In that case, it was camphor, but you know, it can be a lot of different things. The most common one are phthalates. Uh, and basically these um, reduce the intermolecular forces between neighboring chains and make it easier for them to slide past each other. Uh, so plasticizers will basically reduce, serve to reduce that glass transition temperature and make things that would be brittle a little bit more plastic. Um, and an interesting question is, uh, but by the way, this is an old like electrical wire. So I don't know if you've ever seen these super old wires. It's because plasticizer is basically diffused out of the object and it becomes brittle. Um, and I think this is also a big factor in the new car smell. So when you buy a new car, ton of plastic in there and all of these plasticizers, uh, they're more volatile, uh, are leaching out of the plastic. So over time, components become brittle. Uh, Yeah, we'll see. Um, another, I think my favorite plasticizer is probably water. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever like dried a towel or something outdoors or except, right, it gets very stiff and brittle. Um, the mechanism and how that works is still, I think, relatively unexplained, but, but one way of thinking about that is as water is driven off, um, the interaction forces between the cellulose there is stronger. And so it becomes very stiff. Uh, so that's sort of water kind of acting as a plasticizer. Um, and yeah, again, going into this sort of, the plasticizer market is incredibly dyna dynamic and large. Um, so they're used in pretty much every area of chemical uh, industry uh, or polymer industry. Uh, it's growing and there is a move towards moving away from low molecular weight phthalates to sort of more sustainable, um, well, there's a ton of different categories. So it's, it's, it's another, uh, probably gonna be a huge regulatory challenge once research comes in about their environmental effects. And I think that's kind of a recurring theme with polymer research is just the sheer diversity of components. Um, so it's almost like a, a biological problem in some sense uh, when you think about all of this diversity. Um, and yeah, and when it comes to manufacturing, this diversity is great because the building blocks are cheap. Uh, they can be processed in a, uh, they can be chemically tuned to have a variety of properties and they can be processed in, in, in so many different ways. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're just so convenient. But then on the other hand, we, there's sort of an information problem and that's kind of what I want to develop in the next uh, final sets of slides is we just don't know what they are anymore uh, when they go out through the environment. I mean, so this is a picture of kind of a, a sad version of the supply chain. Um, so, you know, the polymer, uh, polymeric precursors will start out in a refinery probably like this. They'll be transited to, uh, you know, this will be in one country, they'll be transited to a country that produces, uh, that manufactures plastic, probably statistically using coal now. Um, uh, then they'll be turned into a pellet. That pellet will be sent to an injection molding facility or something like that. 
made into a product, packaged, shipped to uh, its end market, used for who knows how many years, a year if it's a, a, you know, a disposable uh, packaging, maybe a decade if it's in your car, uh, and then eventually disposed of. And this is a picture of the Ghazipur um, landfill in, in India, where just a lot of this stuff ends up accumulating. So it's, it's, it's an absolutely insane system. Um, and, you know, each time it trades hands, right, the information about what it is is lost. And with that kind of comes uh, the loss of what to do with it productively. So uh, this is kind of an attempt. Uh, this was the, the, this is the recycling scheme in the US of keeping a little bit of information embedded in the object, um, but it's pretty minimal. And as you can probably appreciate now, it tucks, uh, it hides away a lot of the complexity that underlies the reality of that material. There's nothing about plasticizers, there's nothing about processing history, there's nothing about the molecular weight distribution, uh, and it only covers five. Um, so there's a nice NPR article recently on this kind of describing a little bit of the politics behind uh, this scheme and, uh, and basically summarizing, I guess, what I just said about, uh, you know, in addition to the sorting problem, understanding what's there, there's also the practical challenges of recycling it. So here, uh, kind of where the concept of chain weight and recycling meat, uh, every time you process it, you know, you're sort of cutting the chains up a little bit. And so you're degrading, not necessarily degrading, but you're altering the properties. And so you can use it for a different set of applications. Uh, but if you don't know where you're starting with, then it becomes challenging to, to know where you're going to be, and that makes doing stuff with it challenging. Um, I think also, if you've seen any of these recycle these, these products, um, I think it's especially becoming like a hot thing now. Oh, well, you know, we have we have recycled plastic. We're using recycled plastic for this product. Um, if you ever look, it's it's always interesting to look deeper at like what is it actually made of, um, because in many cases it's you know they'll, they'll basically take the recycled plastic and do it to filler. So they're really the, the bulk of the product oftentimes is actually new new plastic fill, um, and they're you know people are you know people are working on, on doing better, but that's a huge problem. Um, but there's it's difficult to get like Anton said, it's difficult to get the same you know quote unquote quality or, or same like no you know very, uh, material properties that you can be really confident about from recycled from, from fully recycled plastic. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so one, one thing is, you know, more information. So, um, in China, I believe this, there's, there's 140, you know, instead of one through seven, it's one through 140. And this, this is sort of that list up to, uh, 27. And so there, you know, it's more captures more of the diversity, but also doesn't quite capture the complexity, uh, behind plastics. And then I found this, uh, actually this morning, this is, um, uh, this is from HP. So whenever HP, the, the computer manufacturer goes, um, I don't know if, if this is actually implemented. This is a proposal that I found that they published. Um, they insist that all of these components are reported for every plastic component that goes into their product, uh, except for disposable packaging. Um, but they require that you tell what the basic polymer is, if there's any flame retardant, uh, if there's any filler or reinforcement, it could be a uh, carbon fiber or non-polymeric component, maybe, if there's plasticizer and if there is any recycled contents, that's actually very comprehensive. Um, so that's, you know, that, that would, you know, enable maybe more efficient recycling, more awareness of sort of supply chains and what goes into the objects that are all around our world. Um, and, you know, it's sort of getting at this idea where, where it, uh, I know also from the policy side in the EU, they're proposing this basically material passport where they're asking for proposals um, to help make this information that, you know, HP uses internally, for instance, available. Um, of course, how that gets implemented is still an open question. And so that's kind of a, it's kind of another challenge that maybe uh, is worth thinking about. How do we, you know, get that information? How do we bring awareness? How do we, um, yeah, make these materials tell their story in some sense? Uh, so there's a lot of funding uh, for these kind of ideas, uh, which might be a step in the right direction. Uh, another sort of solution is with bio-based processing. Um, 
you know, there's, there's biology is, you know, always has uh, some, some trick up their sleeve. So with uh, PET, which is a polyester, um, they found worms that can degrade and essentially eat plastic, right? So I think this, this, this was found out in 2016, where they basically showed these little worms eating a piece of PET, which is basically your water bottles. Um, and then four years later, you have somebody who isolated that enzyme and optimized it and got it. Like this, I, I thought this, this figure was very impressive. Um, right, in 10 hours, 90% of the PET was depolymerized into monomers, which in theory means you could repolymerize and you have brand new starting material, which is uh, really good. And that was done in, um, did they give the time scale there? I think they do in the paper, 16. Anyway, it's quite quick and quite efficient, which is, uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, of course, there's a challenge with other uh, polymers like polypropylene, which lack uh, some of the, the backbone is different. So it's a much more stable um, plastic, but these solutions are promising and you know maybe biology will evolve quickly enough to eat uh, at least some fraction of plastic from the environment. And I think, uh, yeah, one, one of the cool things about this, I don't know if uh, you can emphasize, but like the fact that this is all natural, right? Like this, this is a, this is not something that like, you know, we, we did some work on it after we discovered it, but it was basically like, because there was so much plastic appearing in this landfill, like particularly bacteria over the course of however many bacterial generations evolved to actually extract some small amount of energy from breaking down, you know, the, the plastic that's being taken out. So this is actually like a really, yeah, incredible example. <laughs> <laughs> evolution, yeah, it, it's, you know, we're, we're both, both how evolution can do incredible things and also how we're like, shaping the environment very directly. Yeah. And then the, the second half, I mean, it's, it's <clears throat> evolution plus bioengineering, right? This op, being able to take, go from that starting point of a, dis, of a discovery from, a, from the ecosystem to, um, you know, I don't know if this was a directed evolution approach, probably, but um, yeah, optimizing that enzyme to now, you know, kick it into another gear. Um, so that's quite exciting. Uh, and then there's sort of a, you know, this is, this is a, a community-based approach. So I guess a different type of biology in some sense. This is a project from the Netherlands that spread uh, across most of the world, I think. Um, so this is precious plastic. And basically what they are, they're trying to create a, you know, open knowledge commons for not just understanding plastic, um, but also how to manipulate it at local scale. So all of these tools, they have very well documented um, uh, plans for how to build it. Uh, they have a marketplace for people that do build these things in their free time and can sell it to other people. Um, and really just provide all of this ecosystem to develop uh, communities to for people to understand how plastic works and, and actually do something with it productively in their environment. And, Kind of connecting it with the economic value of what's discarded you know this stuff does add up to billions of dollars um in addition to the environmental impact so uh, to see communities like this growing i think is just a really fascinating development both from just sort of the diffusion of technical expertise that gets out into communities but also um you know just kind of the self-sufficiency that's uh, displayed from it um and here's sort of a cartoon schematic of their network that includes things from shredding cleaning education uh, and marketplace as well. Um, so that's that's it for today. I hope that was a fun introduction of plastics. Uh, that wasn't too dark. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, so it also depends on, on type. There is some flexibility, but yeah, it is, um, it is challenging. They have to be generally cleaned. Uh, if you have dirt in there, it will, um, you know, uh, complicate the process. Um, yeah, it's not. It's also energy intensive. I mean, Pretty, I, in some sense, every process is somewhat energy intensive, right? If we disperse it in the ocean, you know, there's externalities there and you have to collect it. Um, and collecting it once, in the, once it's in the ocean is very energy intensive. Um, 
you know, but you can also imagine coupled with sort of these um, information embedding schemes, right? That becomes much easier. And if you create these systems of, of um, local collection, uh, it just gets easier. So right now we're very loose with how we treat our ways. And by, you know, doing better on that, it does become more manageable to, 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 to recycle these things. And also designing for these processes in mind uh, is something that more people are doing nowadays. Yeah, um, yeah, I hope that was a good starting point and uh, let me know if there's any questions, even on Discord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can definitely yeah, chat classes up all the way on Discord, talk about shipping. I think someone just posted uh, a fun, lighthearted video that contains a lot of the info, so I have not seen it, but we'll repost it. And next time it's bio follower and stuff. Right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, very cool. Uh, no? Is there? I don't think so. Yeah. Homework? Uh, homework? Yeah. Is there homework? All right, homework. <laughs> Let's come up with one. What would be a fun homework? What would you guys do? I know nothing is also a fun homework, but. Classes are basically. Okay, here's the homework. Find an introduction document, two different examples of the same polymer, the same plastic, uh, that are either used in very different applications or have very different properties. So I think one example was this, uh, uh, the plastic, plastic yeah. bag, right, versus the mess suit, is that right? Uh, mass, mess suit yeah, face mask mass versus, uh, versus, mass versus a, a test tube or yeah. made of the same material. So, so basically, I think you can look look around in your environment to find different things that are made of plastic and then find two that are interesting uh, because of their different properties in some way, despite being made of the same the same polymer. And maybe you can, if, if you're curious to learn more, you can figure out maybe why why might these two um, things that are made of the same polymer have different properties. And I guess biomaterials would also count. Biomaterials do also <laughs> count, yes. Cool. Um, and we can, we can throw that on there too. But. Yeah. We'll see you all next time. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who joined. Uh, I think homework for global cohort is exactly the same. Uh, find some plastics in your environment and see if you can find two that are made of the same polymer but have different properties. It'll be interesting to see and compare the different plastics from different places in the world. I think it'll be, yeah, I'm curious if there's any uh, difference in distribution. All right. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Nice, you guys. Awesome. That was.